Yeah, so we, 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 have, a, we have a celebrity guest in the house today, Louis. Uh, right here. Set, set, set your face to stun. It's none other than filmmaker, oh. filmmaker and artist, Ronnie Thomas. Da, da, da. That's right. Hello, folks. We're here for another Today's Decay, July 2nd edition. Louis, Mike, Ronnie. July 2nd? Yeah. Why is that so important? Well, I mean, every day is important. If you, There's a running theme here is that every day is important. And on this yes. day, we're celebrating, well, on all days, we're celebrating births and beginnings and everything important since the dawn of time. And on this day, uh, well, there's a bunch of thing, interesting things happened, one of which was Walter Potter was born on this day in 1835, which seems like a very long time ago. Yeah. And I thought, I don't know very much about Walter Potter, but I know somebody who does. This has suddenly become, this has suddenly become an episode of Pawn Stars. <laughs> I, can, I can call in a, uh, a, a informed person. And Ronnie, that's well, you. I, I'm not sure I know very much about Walter Potter, and I think a lot of people would agree with me. <laughs> but nobody really knows much about the guy. It's kind of what I love about him. You know, there's something very punk rock and DIY about him. You know, he, he never intended to be famous. I mean, I, I, for, for those that don't even know who we're talking about, what are we talking about? So Mr. Walter Potter was the first person to what many people would see as the Dinner for Schmucks dioramas, um, if you know that film, of animals, taxidermy, be in human situations, anthropomorphized animals in taxidermy fashion. And so he did the kitten's wedding, which, you know, I should have those pictures on hand to show. And anyone could look up the kitten's wedding. They sure can. And they can see the amazing artistry of Walter Potter. You sure can. Sorry. You know. Go ahead. And, you know, he was just like kind of this country taxidermist in the middle of nowhere who just did his thing and didn't expect anyone to latch on to it. In the mid 1800s. Flash forward to yeah, but like, 200 years later, exactly. Yeah, but Damien like, Hurst. What's I mean, that? In mid 1800s. Like, who was doing this in the mid 1800s? Well, there was one other French taxidermist called Henri Piquet who was doing his stuff was exhibited at the Crystal Palace at the, um, the World's Fair mm -hmm. in 1842, was it? I'd have to look it up. I mean, check my dates. But it was um, at the at the Crystal Palace. They showed his taxidermy. Pluquet's taxidermy probably had a huge effect on Walter Potter. He probably visited the Crystal Palace, the World Fair, and as a young Walter Potter, he said, "Well, fuck it, I'll do this too." You know, huh. that's at least what Pat Morris, who wrote the book on Walter Potter, said. That, you know, he was gravely influenced by the Victorian taxidermist who were Okay. Okay. Continue, so, Mike. So you're <laughs> so so you're saying he was uh, a taxidermist out in the middle of nowhere who was taxiderming uh, tiny animals and putting them in human clothes that he'd make himself and put putting them in human situations. Yeah, right. He'd, he'd make little glass tasks and um, whatever he could find. You know, one of his most famous pieces, The Death of Cock Robber, which is a great kind of limerick that you'd all know about who will bury the cock robin. You know, the, not I said the sparrow, not I said the, uh, the wind, this and that. Or I forget, but I, I don't know the, the details of it, but. He, um, the details of the limerick took, that we should all know? Yeah. <laughs> I don't pay very much attention to anything. <laughs> I mean, who knows limericks? But, well, it was a good one because it's it's quantifying <laughs> life as we know it, right? Uh -huh. And he, he illustrated that really wonderfully in the death, Life and Death of Cockrum. And he anthropomorphized Cockrum's funeral in this 
really massive tap oh it's owned by pat moritz in cornwall uh -huh. and um it was one of the most astounding pieces of taxidermy that you'll ever see. I mean, was, I mean, there are so many little details in there. And like, how you much, have to be with it. Were, and, and like, how much of this were we with at uh, Morbid Anatomy? Wasn't some of this on display there? Not Cock Robin. The Kitten's Wedding, which is fine, which is probably not the best. In fact, it's probably one of the worst that he did, but it's the weirdest. Uh -huh. You know, Cop Robin is actually good taxidermy, and it's so finely detailed. Whereas the Kitten's Wedding, which was at Morbid Anatomy, were closed, and the Kittens, I think the schoolhouse, not the schoolhouse, the um, tea party was there as well. Uh -huh. No, no, sorry, there was, no, tea party was not there. I accept the apology. The but the Kitten's Wedding is just best for a wedding. And that's not that hard to do. You can just dress up the kittens yeah. and put little clothes on them. Whereas Cock Robin, the, it, the detail in that piece, like the graves that were dug, um, you know, the plumage that they're wearing to suggest that there were others that had come before them, it's the Cock Robin CR on the graves, every grave in the graveyard, which is plentiful, has the letter R for Robin. Um, and if you watch the film, I think that that's some of the things that I latched on to. Like, why was this guy so attuned into detail? And the kid wedding and the sea party was well further. Wait, you're saying the film? So you're saying there's a film about him? There's a film that it had some asshole made. <laughs> Are you saying you made a film about Walter Potter? Some asshole. <laughs> it may have been myself. Everybody, everybody poops, Ronnie. Everybody poops. <laughs> To some of us shit don't know. <laughs> it was the film was an adventure because I actually didn't know anything about the guy at the time. And I didn't know what to make of him, but that that's the best way to enter any adventure, right? You did not know anything about it and learn as you go. Yeah, sure. So I learned about Walter Potter in the only way that I could learn about him through my own process. And you know, you see what like as you're doing right now. Stroking your dog's belly. <laughs> you learn about what, you learn very quickly what makes something happy. Yeah. Right. Or, or yourself at the same time. So, so meanwhile, so he made all these uh, dioramas with, with stuffed. Um, uh, dead animals. Yeah, dead animals. And like. He did this for money. He did this like just for kicks, and it was on display in a local so, area. He did it. Because his job was taxidermy. He was a local taxidermist. Uh huh. But he also had this weird fetish for putting some of the animals into poses, the ones that he weren't, that he wasn't doing for all purposes. So, tax so, 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 so taxidermy, but make it sexy. Yeah, he was sexifying facts, but cool. he was making it attractive. <laughs> and he certainly did, because the local pub that he was working for started paying him to display his work. So his little taxidermy shop was behind a, a bar, and the taxidermy shop, was because he was doing all this weird stuff, was bringing in all these wild customers and the club was like all right we'll just pay you to keep your museum open basically um and we'll you know you don't have to pay us rent and we'll pay you to keep it open just keep doing what you're doing and i love that you know I mean, there's some purity to just outsider art being accepted as insider art uh -huh. if that makes any sense okay sure is that going way too out there for your viewership uh, there's no way to edit this, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, but if I could say anything, if I could say anything about Potter, and if there's anything I wanted to say with the film I made, and if anyone cares to listen, it's this wild notion that if you do what you want to do, eventually it will work for you.
even if you're dead by the time it works for you, it'll still like Potter's absolute and enigmatic and eternal. He will, his legacy will never die, despite the fact that he never knew that his legacy would never die. Yeah, because that makes sense. Well, sure, because nobody really knew him. Correct me if I'm wrong. Until like the last generation ish, right? The last twenty years, and, let's and say. still nobody knows him. You know, and nobody really knows who the guy was. I mean, does anybody you know anybody, anybody really? Oh, <laughs> does anybody know anybody anyway? <laughs> I'm just, I, I think I'm just to saying. some degree. I'm, I'm just saying. Well, look, you can draw parallels to Forrest Ackerman. You could draw parallels to Ray Harryhausen, Thomas Coons. Like all these people, oh. you know, these wild things. If only there was but a film can... about Thomas Coons. <laughs> I hope that some. I hope someday somebody makes a more thorough film. But I don't know that he'll be able to sit down to let that happen. I think Thomas would have to be very old and tired for uh -huh. that to happen because uh -huh. he is just busting away at stuff. Yeah. The guy doesn't stop. No. And I think that Potter was very similar. You know, I don't think Potter ever stopped doing his thing for fame and notoriety. I don't think he cared about that. Same as Potter didn't care about that. He just did his thing. And maybe, you know, even myself or yourself, you know, you just do your thing and see what happens. No. Yeah, I'm, until I stop. That's why I invested in a lot of t-shirts. <laughs> Okay, sure, why not? I guess I, I have a lot of t-shirts too, so if you're saying I can somehow feel better about that, then great. Yeah, I will, I will feel, I think better. So. I I'll think, feel better about I, that. I, I think if I have to go on an unedited scroll, yes. I think you do your thing. I think that's honorable. I think that there are very few people who do what they're just compelled to do, and I think that's what Potter's legacy is. Uh -huh. It's doing this thing whether people care about it or you don't even realize that they do care about it, if that makes any sense. And he was just going to do it anyway. And I think the film, and I encourage the four people who give a fuck what I'm saying to watch the film. Because there's some really, I think there's some good knowledge in there. I think there's some real wisdom in there mm -hmm. from the collectors of the work. Because most of the film's about the people who collect his work. So you can get into their heads. So you're saying your film is versus... pretty good. Oh, I don't know if it's good. I just I think it's it's a tribute to people like Potter mm -hmm. and the people who collect and appreciate his work. Does that make any sense? Anything I'm saying make any sense? Yeah, sure. Why not? Um, <laughs> but I, I will also say that on this day. In 1914, Hannes Bach was born, who is a who? Hannes Bach, H-A-N-N-E-S-B-O-K. He was a illustrator. Uh, here is his cover art for Who Goes There, which became the uh, the thing or the thing from another world. Here, He'd be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here is his uh, skull face and others by Robert E. Howard, if you can see that. And why are you showing this? Well, are because, these because he was today? because he was born on this day, Hannes Bach, in nineteen fourteen. Uh, it's not it's not just Walter Potter Day. Also, he did House <laughs> in the Borderland. Uh, this is probably one of my favorites. Uh, Arkham House, nineteen forty eight. I want to say forty seven, something like that. Um, it's a good cover. It is a good cover, and it's a great contents. Uh, also, on this day, the first World Science Fiction Convention started in nineteen thirty nine here in New York City. So, when you're talking about like you know, being a crazy person and just being totally inspired by whatever it is you're inspired by. Early science, science, science of fiction fandom, which was like early sci-fi fandom in the 20s and 30s, kind of culminates in the 1939 World's Fair, which you mentioned Forry Ackerman before, and he took a Greyhound bus across the country and paid for Ray Bradbury to come with him because Ray, Ray was a couple years younger than him and didn't have money to do it, and they arrived here in New York and Forey had made himself with the help of his girlfriend at the time uh, a a reproduction of the 1939 or 37, whatever year it was uh, The Shape of Things to Come, the Raymond Massey 
futuristic costume. So he walked around. Mm-hmm. He walked around New York City dressed in like a futuristic costume, en route to the first World Science Fiction Convention. Um, <laughs> so he's he's the first you, he's the first cosplayer. By doing what do you so. think the relationship between science fiction and surrealism is? There's there's a real connection I think between the two. I guess uh, yeah I, maybe I don't know I think I mean well, science fiction's supposed to be. Science fiction is supposed to be very based in uh, fact, where fantasy should be, uh, you know, allowed to run rampant, a-, a-, a la surrealism. So I would say yeah, but... somebody more along the lines of um, maybe Robert E. Howard, or even a Clark Ashton Smith, could be more fantasy based and therefore more surrealist based, kind of. But no, but I think I think there's a real connection between, like, so Blade Runner. Which I think is a really boring movie. Is really to me very sci-fi, but also surrealistic at the same time. I think there's a real weird connection between the two. I, I mean, something like Tetsuo, I feel like works as a combo of a combo platter, so to speak, of science fiction and surrealism. <laughs> right, Tetsuo the Iron Man. You know, um, I don't know it. Yeah, like Japanese. Is it early eighties? I know Voltron. Uh huh. Yeah. Voltron's very surreal to me. I recall Voltron. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I've been thinking a lot about like. I don't know if I feel like a left. I don't know if I feel like the left foot of Voltron, but I do feel like a heel. <laughs> yeah. No, you're more of a shin. <laughs> Thank you. No, I, I do that, but I, and I think the times we're living in procure a lot of the stuff we're talking about, like right. So it's. We can only be hedging towards weird times. Like if I, things are weird, they can only get weirder in a creative way. Hopefully. Well, I think we're. I, I think. I, I think we're uh, uh, in route to big trouble. Actually. Well, I, I definitely agree. Well, I think specifically we're we're in route for big trouble in Little China. Because that <laughs> because because that premiered this day in nineteen eighty six. I think we were in little trouble from Big Bang. Uh-huh, uh-huh, maybe. Yeah. And yeah. the exact opposite. <laughs> so anyway, the, so, so anyway the, the point here is, because I don't know what runtime we're on at this point, and I try to keep this under 15 minutes. Doesn't matter. Well, it uh, does, because Instagram won't do more than 15 minutes on its own in a clip. Uh, <laughs> I realized this Howie Pyro thing I did the other week was like 30 minutes long, and it was like, nobody's going to watch this. It's over we se- can't talk for thirty minutes, Mike. I'm it, very sad. Well, because it's, it's over. It's over several segments, and nobody's going to watch this in several segments. Anyways, <laughs> the the point is, uh, you know, here on today's decay, you can you can consider watching the Walter Potter uh, uh, short film that Ronnie made. Uh, consider checking out some Hannes Bach artwork because his stuff is fantastic. Um, the World Science Fiction Convention is super exciting and nerdy and ridiculous and uh maybe consider watching big trouble little china later today weren't you going to show us some walter potter stuff oh i'd have to find it all right okay some other time maybe next Somewhere year back ne- next year next year uh, ne- next june 2nd yes next oh, I mean, all right all right so we'll, we'll make an agreement right. it'll be next year in bay ridge yeah <laughs> or ridgewood one or the other one, one of those ridges <laughs> Bay Ridgewood. If we could just combine them, right? <laughs> if we could, if we could fold space time. Oh, well, I wish I'd, I'd, I look forward to the day where we could just hang out. Oh yeah, could you imagine that? Those were the days, my friend. Yeah, I, know. I wish they never end. <laughs> yeah. I know. Look at this little dude. Anyhow, it's Mike. I miss you, pal. Miss you too. Oh, uh, Ride my motorcycle out there. Yeah. Do it. I'll bring some water. All right. Meanwhile, you, we'll, we'll see you tomorrow, and thanks for tuning in. Goodbye. Click. Who are you talking to? What? The, the people on the television. <laughs> That's me. I'm on the television. All right. The people on the phone. <laughs> Get off the phone. <laughs>